to the latest edition of the MIT Sloan Expert Series, which brings you an inside look at some of the most exciting new ideas and research happening at MIT Sloan. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight. In this special three-part installment, we are looking at the future of sports. In this episode, we will look at the implications of the COVID-19 health crisis on players and games. I'm joined by Ben Shields. He's a senior lecturer here at MIT Sloan, a former ESPN executive, and the author of The Sports Strategist and the Elusive Fan. Thank you so much for being here, Ben. Oh, I'm happy to be joining you. So let's talk a little bit about the sports calendar. So we've now endured a few months now without live sports. And while some leagues and teams are making plans to resume play and some, some we are starting to see games happening in Europe, we're still really in hiatus and in limbo. What are the consequences here? What, what do you think could happen to the sports calendar? Well, for me, Rebecca, I think it's a real innovation opportunity to try things a little bit differently than maybe the way that they've been played in the past. You bring up the sports calendar. We're going to have a really interesting situation where leagues and teams and sports are playing at a time of year where they're not used to playing. So for instance, in the fall, there's going to be options for sports fans everywhere if in fact leagues and teams come back at that moment in time. For me, I think this is a golden opportunity to reassess the sports calendar. You might be familiar with the sports solstice, that time in October when the NHL, NFL, NBA, and Major League Baseball, plus college football are all playing at the same exact time. And yet in July and August, the sports world is a little bit quieter. From a competitive standpoint, when sports leagues and teams are trying to attract the time and money for fans, why is that? Is this an opportunity to do something differently? Now, could we see the Masters happening in the fall every single year? Probably not. I mean, there's some events that have a natural place on the sports calendar. But for those leagues that are interested in staking out a stronger competitive position, at times of the sports calendar where they're not as busy, take this opportunity to realign the way your events are at this moment in time for the future. So what does this mean in terms of the games and the meets and the matches themselves? I mean, are, are they gonna stay the same length with this grand restructuring and reordering of the sports calendar that you're, that you're talking about? I, I think this is another opportunity for innovation here. And from my standpoint, I think there's, real need for sports organizations to make their product more scarce. From my view, many sports leagues are overexposed. There's so much product available. I mean, you think about Major League Baseball, 162 games throughout the season. Now, to be clear, there's a good reason for that. Growth has often meant more revenue, which means wealthier teams, players, and owners. But there's also a league out there named the National Football League that has thrived on scarcity throughout its history. They're expanding their season to 17 games, but it's still 17 games, one per week per team. Scarcity, in my view, is their most valuable asset. So we're now at a point in time in the sports industry, as we come back, can you leverage scarcity just a little bit more? In many respects, sports leagues are going to be forced to do that. What can you learn from that? Are there models where hmm, maybe we shorten the season a little bit more to make our product more valuable to make up for any lost revenue that we would have in a shortened season? Scarcity not only applies to the length of the season, the number of games that are available, but also to how long the games last. One of my favorite sports innovation examples is in the cricket world. And in cricket, you know, there are five day long matches and one day long matches. And the IPL introduced 2020, which is a format that gets done in two and a half hours. I think there are really important opportunities to play around with different concepts to make the product more scarce. Otherwise, we're in a situation where sports products become a commodity. Let's not let that happen as we come back to playing the games. 
So Ben, you were talking about scarcity. We Live sports has been a scarce commodity during this sports hiatus. So, but there have been some emergent sports that have come about that is that is occupying our time. Talk about those and do you think that they'll have staying power? Well, it's interesting, Rebecca. There is always a risk reward calculation that sports organizations have to make. No matter what, just given the nature of sports, it could run the risk of virus transmission. But there are some sports that have done that risk reward calculation and they're trying to seize the opportunity. One interesting one that I've been monitoring is Premier Lacrosse League or the PLL. And once the Summer Olympics in Tokyo were canceled, NBC then had a two week window in its programming schedule that needed to be filled. So the PLL being a 14 team league said, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll take that window. And what they've done is created a two week format. One week is group play, second week is a tournament. And that's when they're going to play their season. They're doing a bubble league. And because they have a smaller number of teams and athletes, then they're willing to take that risk because the reward in getting into the public consciousness, especially as an emerging sport, could be outsized for them. Another interesting story in the pandemic has been the rise and acceleration of esports. Again, this is another one of those topics that the disruption was happening if, if at a slower pace. But given the pandemic, the innovation of esports is very much here. iRacing, which is a form of racing for NASCAR, as well as Formula One esports, these have been important ways to fill the void. And I don't think they're going anywhere anytime soon. A key point here, Rebecca, is whether it's PLL or if it's esports, is the industry embracing new formats, new competitive formats in this period of experimentation. Even a league like the NHL, they've sort of been forced into innovating, but if they do continue their season, it's going to be a 24-team playoff format. So look, bottom line is, when it comes to the competitive formats, whether it be the, the playoffs or rule changes or whatever the case may be, it's actually riskier in my view, not to innovate and try something new because this is almost a, a blank canvas for sports organizations to see what works and see what might last as a change for the future. So another question here, talking about the different, how teams are experimenting with different formats. What about the way the games are played themselves? As we're learning more about how COVID spreads and transmission, we are we are finding that contact sports especially do, are, are, are really not good for, for passing COVID. So do you predict that we're going to see changes in how games are played? It's certainly a fascinating discussion to have. I mean, look, when it comes to sports, it's not exactly following social distancing guidelines. I mean, I know NFL wide receivers would love to have a little extra space when they're running routes, but certainly the defenses won't let that happen. And so it'll be interesting to see what types of changes occur. So in cricket, for instance, where saliva is key to bowlers, that might be banned. You can no longer use the sort of spitball in the sport. And that, that could change decades of the way it's been played. I'm fascinated to see how these types of changes may affect the action on the field. Agreed. And let's bring in another new voice to this conversation, Ben, to talk, to delve into these issues a little bit more. I'd like to welcome Christina Chase to the program. She is the managing director and co-founder of the MIT Sports Lab and a lecturer at the School of Engineering at MIT. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Christina. It's my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. So Christina, during these lockdowns and quarantines, so many of us are working from home and it sounds like the professional athletes are doing the same thing, training from home. Do you think that that will have a lasting impact? Do you think that we're gonna to continue to see that once this health emergency has passed? Yeah, I, that's a great question. I think the best in the business are going to see trends around what it means to be in facility and training and testing and what it means to have kind of be the remote training aspect. Some teams have been 
a lot more hands-on where they still have their injured players coming into facilities safely, uh, but our, our training with them one-on-one -on -one, um, and shipping equipment and doing a lot more remote workouts. Um, there are others who have been a lot more hands-off and have prescribed a workout plan and aren't even monitoring to see whether or not uh, those workout plans are, are being done consistently. I think it's gonna be interesting to see, there could be some very interesting takeaways to see um, what our optimal training, both off-season, pre-season, in-season uh, workflows and training protocols that could be adopted um, to allow for a higher level of competition, even when not on site. Yeah, that, that'll be fascinating, Christina, to, to monitor. You know, one other aspect here is the, the mental health of athletes and certainly being in quarantine and not getting out as much. Arguably, it has shined an even brighter light on the importance of ensuring the mental health of, of athletes as well. I mean, what are your, some of your reflections on on that challenge, especially in light of COVID? And perhaps does does it mean that uh, that mental health will be um, even more of a, a an important consideration for the sports world even after the crisis? That's a great point, Ben. Those who are already looking at how to track mental health um, are leaning in to the opportunities around also being able to start to train their athletes to be ready to play um, in stadiums or arenas without fans. There are also real challenges around suddenly having a very structured day uh, no longer exist, essentially having to put one's own structure in place, um, level of contact with coaches and trainers, uh, depending on roster size, depending on uh, the team's culture, uh, that's gonna have a lot of influences to uh, those players who are able to accelerate the, the mental aspect, the mental training aspect of coming back to gameplay and uh, that, that level of the elite athlete, both um, in training, but also on the pitch, on the field, in the arena, on the court. Christina, one final question, and that is that we have been talking on this in this three-part series on the future of sports about innovation, and you are the co-founder of the MIT Sports Lab, so you are already helping teams and leagues think about innovation. How do you? How would you describe their mindset, their approach in terms of this crisis? Are they thinking about experimentation? Are they open-minded or, or how would you describe what, you, what you're thinking, what they're saying, saying to, to you? It's an excellent question. And what I'm seeing is that those that we work with and, and those who are um, more on the forefront of innovation are really leaning in to start to think about what are those opportunities for experimentation that um, we might be able to take advantage of Similar to what Ben was saying, there's this unique window of time whereby experimentation is less risky. And yet there's a significant upside and opportunity by which that competitive edge can have meaningful impact and results. And so what we're seeing are those execs and those coaches and those teams uh, reaching out and asking us how they might rethink the game, the business, the, the, the broader sport in ways that they could experiment with now and start to lead to new ways of both playing, training, and, and running their businesses. A lot of exciting developments ahead. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Christina, and thank you too, Ben. My thank pleasure, you. thank you. And thank you at home for tuning in to today's discussion. For more on the MIT Sloan Expert Series, head to mitsloan.mit.edu.